Hey there entrepreneurs, my name is Sushant and welcome to Trep Talks. This is the show where I interview successful e-commerce entrepreneurs, business executives and thought leaders and ask them questions about their business story and also dive deep into some of the strategies and tactics that they have used to start and grow their businesses. And today I'm really excited to welcome Brad Moss to the show. Brad is the CEO of Product Labs. Product Labs is a full-service Amazon strategy consulting and management firm. Some of the services they provide include brand and product management, marketing, inventory and logistics management, business intelligence, sales channel expansion, customer service, and more. Brad also has spent over two years at Amazon as a business leader where he was the former head of Amazon Seller Central and Seller Central App. And today I want to ask Brad a few questions about his startup story and some of the ways Product Labs helps Amazon businesses grow and succeed. So thank you so much for joining us today at Trip Talk Spread. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sushant. Perfect. So let's uh, get right into it. I, I know that you have a background uh, from Amazon. I'm very interested in learning a little bit more uh, about, you know, what was your work at Amazon and how did you, uh, what motivated you to start Product Labs? Yeah, so, um, you know, <clears throat> I actually got hired into Amazon. Um, I'd been an entrepreneur for several years before. I went back and got uh, my, my master's in business. And um, coming out of that master's, Amazon uh, contacted me and asked me to apply. And I uh, applied and went through the interview process and got the job. <laughs> um, and uh, it was a great experience. You know, I actually I spent a lot of years in, in video games and uh, gaming, both both mobile, tablet, console games, kind of all of them. And so when I went into Amazon, I, um, the thought was, hey, let's let's uh, let's see if we can do a, a gamification platform for for sellers. I don't know if you're familiar with what that it was, but um, it's kind of a, a platform that helps sellers know what the goal should be to grow their their business and um, and gives them rewards and achievements and things like that. And so we actually built this really cool platform. That was the very first thing I, I built inside of Amazon and. Uh, the day before we launched, I got my engineer pulled from me <laughs> mm. um, and some kind of middle management stuff above me. And uh, I had no control over it, but it was awesome. It, like the whole platform still to this day would have been amazing to have on there. Um, but from there, I, because I got to know Seller Central and the systems is so extremely well uh, going through that process uh, and building that, that gamification system, uh, I then moved to the role of being the the business leader over all of Seller Central platform. So uh, what that means is there was over 256 different systems inside of Seller Central that were operating at that time, and I had to basically start herding cats. You know, as as everyone was had their own uh, objectives, priorities. It was hey, let's how do we streamline some of these things? How do we uh, help sellers understand their businesses a little bit easier and better? And as you can see to this day, uh, not a ton was done. <laughs> mm. um, we did some work and a lot of back end stuff. We did some improvements, um, but again, like the full UI still, in my opinion, needs to be reworked. Um, but they uh, they didn't really backfill my job. When I moved uh, from seller, running Seller Central to, uh, there's a new business, you know, it's always about new business at Amazon, and it was the mobile app. So. It's Seller Central on the mobile device, and that's I built the business case, and um, and and with that I got it passed through the VPs, SVPs, and uh, got the funding to go build uh, mobile uh, Seller Central on mobile devices, and that was a so if you have the Amazon Seller app, that was my baby, um, and uh, with that uh, I felt like okay I had done a lot of various things at Amazon, I felt like I'd done my damage there, and it was a time to to move on for me in my life. So uh, I moved on and I, I didn't immediately think of going into the seller world, um, even though I had, had so much experience in working with so many sellers at that point. Um, as soon as I uh, left though, so many people, a lot of people just acquaintances or friends or whatever people had seen that I'd worked at Amazon and where I was, they reached out, they're like, hey, I'm launching this new business. Hey, I'm doing this on Amazon, I need help. And I realized there's this huge gap in Amazon providing business intelligence to sellers, and it's still there to this day. So, what I did is, as I said, hey, I think there's a, you know, as an entrepreneur, you always look for opportunity that comes and tries to find you, also. Um, and so I uh, built, uh, I contacted a former business partner or a former um, 
colleague of mine at Amazon, who's another business lead, he ran a, a quarter of a billion dollar business there also. And, um, and uh, he, you know, we always talk about entrepreneurship stuff. And so we started Product Labs, essentially. And we built a, a technology platform underneath everything that provides very actionable and valuable business intelligence information for sellers. And um, it wasn't just the business intelligence, it was the automation and it was the uh, providing actionable data. Um, so things that we want to and strive to take action on um, and understanding when to take action, what, what to do with listings and, and how to adjust them and when sales are down, why are they down? We can go down to the very minute details of exactly what's going on. Um, so we built a software and a bunch of processes all over this uh, on top of this. And then we built a, a consulting and kind of services uh, arm that does uh, consulting work and technology work and, and services for, for brands, both very big and public companies down to very small companies, uh, startups. Um, typically, if someone's serious, I mean, ser about starting a brand and launching a brand, um, you know, they'd be a good fit for what we're doing. Um, and uh, yeah. So, so definitely, I want to talk more about your technology platform and things like that. But one thing that I'm really curious about is, did you ever work with Jeff Bezos? <laughs> of course, he's the <laughs> richest man yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's so interesting. Um, at Amazon Marketplace, we made so much money, and Marketplace still makes so much money for Amazon. It basically, it supplements whatever's going on out uh, going on on the retail side. Now retail was kind of like, hey, this is our show horse. This is the, this is the main thing that they always focused on because that's where they started from traditionally, and they had control over price on the retail side, um, and a lot of other various things. But the marketplace side, so this marketplace for third party sellers, where third party sellers can go and list their products and, and have they have control of the price point. They're doing all sorts of stuff. We slowly grew and then surpassed everything that was going on at retail, mm -hmm. and Bezos was so busy with. Uh, the Fire Phone at the time, hmm. uh, and uh, some of his other pieces. If he paid attention to this whole piece of the business, it was always the retail side. Hmm. Uh, he very rarely paid attention to the seller side. Uh, I think partially because he had a really strong business leader in there. Um, Peter Ferrisi is a really strong business leader who was running the the uh, seller central side of things. Um, and so I worked with Peter uh, very closely and um, uh, on you know, we'd have weekly meetings or bi-weekly meetings about all sorts of stuff going on. So I didn't uh, ever need to go. There was never really a need because our business was so healthy and so profitable. It wasn't like Jeff needed to work on this business, right? We were, we were, we were kind of the bread and butter of Amazon. People talk about AWS. In reality, the mar third-party marketplace makes most money for Amazon um, in terms of profit of any business it has. But when they do the reporting, they report out third-party business marketplace with the uh, vendor side so it's all blended together and so it doesn't look as profitable because um, the losses from vendor and, and fba merge with the marketplace side of things so maybe um, maybe i can ask one more question about just just about amazon because as you were talking about peter and, and leadership and things like that yeah i just became really curious you know uh amazon like a, one of the you know biggest companies in the world now uh, i think maybe the biggest um what you know, when you say Peter is a very strong leader, like what what did you notice at Amazon? Was it like the personal attributes of a leader like uh, Peter? Like what was he doing differently or was it like the whole culture that was that was driving people to be uh, really good? Uh, what were your impressions about the whole leadership and culture part of Amazon? Yeah. So that's that's a huge, yeah, huge topic. And it's wonderful. Um the uh, it's almost like the HR side of things. You know, people say, "Hey, once your business gets to a certain size, all you deal with is people, <laughs> mm. and you're not, you're not even dealing with problems anymore. You're just dealing with people, yeah. and people will tackle the problems." I think Bezos, one of his geniuses, is how well he can streamline any process and cut through all the crap and figure out exactly what's going on. Um, that's one of the genius, geniuses of Bezos, and I think. It's, uh, it's permeated, and I said this years ago, I think he's gonna have more influence on business than uh, any of uh, the other leaders at the time. Um, because it was it was his method and his way of thinking about how to, it's, it's not just like, hey, here's a report, it's, it's uh, breaking down and streamlining a report, so as you know, you might have heard, you know, there's no PowerPoints at Amazon. You can just hide stuff in PowerPoints, and you got sales guys who are just talking. 
it's like if if something is um, here's a good example in writing our business papers we would always give it the fourth grader test mm. right could could I give this to my fourth grader and they understand what I'm saying mm. if they can't then that's not well written mm. right that was like one of the first times I'd heard that because going through school and and uh, higher level education and everything it's like you got these you're reading these crazy articles from professors you got to read one paragraph like four times just to understand what it is it's even saying and these professors are so deep into what they're saying and they're, they're putting all the stuff in there it's like no according to amazon and the amazon way of thinking that's just terribly written right like if it's really well written a fourth grader could read it and understand what's going on and and i did and i've read these things from the most complex business situations or technical situations you've ever seen, when they're well written, you can understand them no matter who you are, where you're coming from. And um, I think that's one of the geniuses of, of Amazon and what Bezos has instilled into his company. And I think it's a lot from his influence as well as some of the principles, but he finds people and he's trained people along the ways to really simplify these very complex business problems into just the core nugget. What does he need to understand, right? And um, you know, there's that concept of the six pager. Is no business, no business paper or anything can be longer than six pages. That was okay. that was the theory. Is that any com any business uh, situation, no matter how complex, could be covered in six pages. And I've seen that totally true. And that's like with spacing and formatting, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. It's not tiny font. Yeah. It's like when it's well written, it really can be. And if you got more stuff to follow up, then put it into another six pager that's about a different topic or you add a huge appendices. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be uh, uncharacteristic to see a six pager followed by 30 pages of appendices mm. that support arguments that are going on inside the six pager. But it just speaks to like, hey, this is the process of boiling up and simplifying the core data and core information that you need to understand uh, when you're when you're making business decisions. And that's what part of made uh, that's part of what made Peter so great is he understand he understood how to take a very complex tech organization and boil it down to very simple concepts and to be able to tackle problems that way. Um, and uh, it wasn't just him. I mean, there were some some of the best. Uh, most professional people I've ever met in the world. Uh, a lot of the directors, there's several directors there that I met that were some of the most brilliant people, uh, both interpersonally and in dealing with business problems uh, that I'd ever met. Unfortunately, none of them are still at Amazon. Um, mm. People I'd worked with, there's a high turnover right there. Uh, but uh, Why is that? Uh, it's really hard to work for Amazon. Um, I don't think they necessarily treat their people internally the best in terms of like the soft skills. I think that's where uh, Bezos could use a lot of uh, support. He probably, he has, a, I'm sure he has a, a very countering position where if in his mind it's a machine and it's a business and he doesn't necessarily care about um, if the processes are good, the people who are running it, you know, he can burn them out. And that's just kind of the been the process the whole time, right? So like, it, and it wouldn't be, you know, some other thing, another example is like, I built a business that built, that was going, was on track to do 300 million within my first year of launching that business, right? And what did they do? What what was the response from Amazon? It was, good job, you did your job, here's a 2% raise for the year, right? <laughs> like your normal standard raise. It wasn't like, hey, you just made us a ton of money and we're going to give you something. Uh, you know, there's pros and cons for running the business that way, but as an employee, it's like, well, I'm an entrepreneur, I've been taught to be an entrepreneur, and I'm doing crazy things inside this company to make stuff happen that no one has ever done before and people have been trying to launch mobile for years before me and I just did it and then the response is like good job uh, <laughs> when is it gonna be a billion dollars right it's like it's never enough so it's unsatiable so for most people um, having that kind of experience is tough uh, on a personal life and uh, on a personal level and um, and it's hard work Right, and I'm not scared of hard work, and I did a lot of hard work. But after a while, it's like well, this is not—it's not even beneficial hard work, right? It's just hard work for hard work's sake. I'm not even seeing any upside for myself because they built this anyway. This other HR policy. So there's some, uh, yeah. As you can see, I got mixed feelings. There's some really great things, but also some things where Amazon really struggles. Um, but uh, at its core, you know, there's some genius, some genius ways of uh, thinking about and analyzing problems. Okay. Let's uh, let's move on to product labs now. Um, I know that you work with e-commerce businesses. Uh, I'm very curious to know what what is your ideal 
e-commerce business that you work with? Is it like based on size or you know what criteria do you have when you um, look for clients uh, to work with? And uh, uh, maybe you can share a little bit about the services that you provide and and yeah. you know what what is the way that that you charge your clients? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, you know, we, I come from, from the gaming side, I come from, uh, I'm a Nintendo fan at heart, uh, grew up with Nintendo and, uh, still like Sony and Microsoft played all of them. But, uh, one of the things that's so beautiful about those games is that it's very simple to understand, but then very deep to master, right? It's simple to, to understand, but takes you forever to actually master it. Uh, I bring that up because in the way we interact with our clients is that we like to provide our clients very simplified core key information um, about their business. So, hey, they can come in and take a look at the data and the information and just understand what's going on in a clear way. Mm -hmm. So they got to learn our framework a little bit to, to get that. But then once they understand it, then it's then it's, oh, they can just pick up a sheet, understand what's going on with their business. Great. If they have questions, they can then dive in as deep as they want with our team to go after the various different uh, issues of what's going on with their business. So, you know, in terms of how we operate, we like to provide the most actual, most relevant data to our clients at any given point. And so for me, it's always simplifying stuff and providing them what they need. If they ever want more data, we will go deeper and we have it all. We have all the depth of it uh, to go in and help them understand. Um, and that's one of the, the kind of the, the things that we've really focused on as a company is analyzing Amazon in such a way that we can go deep and we know what's wrong at any point when sales are up or down. Like I could pinpoint on any SKU why sales are where they are um, and, uh, and tell you what, what's going on and what we need to do to change that. Um, so it's, uh, you know, in terms of working with clients, we like to provide both high level strategy and then down to the tactics if they want to get into the roll up their sleeves and get into the dirty work. Um, many clients like the high level stuff, uh, and that's all that they want to sit. And that's, that's all they want to, they want to see. So some want to get into the, the nitty gritty details all the time. Um, in terms of our, our, uh, our ideal client, well, I should say our fee structure, let me just talk about that. Our generally way we set up our fee structures, we have a monthly baseline based on the skew size or the skew count and the sales volume those are the two biggest predictors we found in terms of uh, man hours and labor that we work on stuff and then we typically set a benchmark of wherever their sales are uh, some kind of threshold with them and then we set a commission on our sales growth um, because so really what we do is we lower what if i was just to do a baseline fee then it would be higher but we lower what that would be and then we put have this commission piece so that we're incentivized to grow their business because uh, clients always want to see their businesses grow. That's one of the, uh, the core tenets of, of this. It's people want to see their business grow. Yeah. Um, so that's that's basically how we do it. It's a hybrid structure of like a baseline fee plus a commission on, on how we grow their business. Um, we do a few variations for, for businesses with different reasons and sizes, but that's kind of the standard. Now, the ideal client for us... Um, I think the ideal client is someone who, who wants to be very intelligent about their business and um, and understands what it takes to grow their business and to achieve their goals. Now, that's a very kind of vanilla uh, response, uh, but, but really we serve clients from very large to very small, and we found the best ones are ones who understand what it takes to achieve their goals and understands what we're doing and um, are willing to put in what it takes. So if I tell someone, hey, it's gonna cost you, if you wanna grow from 100,000 a month to 500,000 a month, it's gonna cost you an extra 100,000 in advertising spend based on all this analysis, blah, blah, blah. I'm, just, I'm making a, a, an extreme example here. But it, you know, here's all this data and it's gonna cost you $100,000 to grow there. And the client says, okay, I get it and understand it and let's go for it. Or let's change our goal from 500,000 to 200,000. What's that going to cost in terms of advertising or adjustments or whatever? Um, instead of unrealistic expectations of saying, I want to grow from 100000 a month to 500000 a month, and you got you know $5,000 more a month in ad spend to do that, which is way out of whack in terms of advertising spend um, ratios that, that we see on the platform. So, um, yeah, that's kind of one of the keys. But, but really, there's four areas that we found clients – that come to us. We got the startups. We love them. We built a lot. Uh, one of my favorites is a mom 
who was selling on Etsy and we brought her on the platform and she wasn't able to keep up on inventory for the first two years that she was with us because hmm. uh, we kept growing so well and so quickly with her. Um, and then we have the SMB, so small and medium businesses. So these are businesses that are really chugging along. Um, we help them refine their process or scale from a one person business to a uh, with a team, our team comes in, acts as their team to help them scale it from one person to several people. Um, and then you have enterprise businesses, so could be a large um, company. I've uh, got some public companies that we work with, and uh, the reporting is just different on there, and there's different understandings, but we help them understand actually what's going on inside of Amazon when most um, w- when it's so difficult and most people don't have the same type of uh Actually, I've never found a firm with the same type of reporting that we have and, and how to clearly communicate what's going on with their business inside of Amazon. Um, and so those are fantastic also. And then the last one is, are these investor-based businesses. So Amazon businesses are selling, right? Um, investors come in and they buy it and then they don't know what, what to do or they want it stabilized or they want it secured. Uh, and we come in and run and operate the business for them as they take it over from, from the person that they've sold it to. Um, and we've done that on a large and small scale. We ran all of this uh, this company Thrasio has been in the news. We ran majority of their uh, profile of their company for the first uh, more than half of their life at the time, and uh, helped them stabilize a lot of their businesses. And now you know they've done quite well, as well as um, uh, many others that we've that we've helped them support there. So those are the kind of the four big groups: investors, enterprise, SMBs, and startups. So when we talk about let's say the startups you know a lot of the times um when a business is really just an idea or a lot of times when you know someone is thinking hey i want to start this business you know is it worth it to to start on amazon and they want they're they're trying to uh, feel the market um how does or how would you uh, try to figure out uh, the demand of a certain uh, product uh, and and the competitive market uh, uh, intelligence on Amazon. So uh, I mean, I saw on your website uh, one case study was of Whiskers laces, which is laces. Shoelaces are really like a commodity product. You know, you can find shoelaces all all kinds cheap. And but this is a premium product. Um, when they say that I want to sell on Amazon, like the the kind of time and effort that would require to get their business going how do you determine that is it it's even worth it to spend that kind of time and money to to get that business on amazon so yeah that's all on the business owner that's on on his shoulder so we always say we're not in the business of picking winners um we we're in the business of supporting those who have who who picked their own racehorse and we're we're uh, grooming and maturing and supporting that racehorse to get as far as it will go inside the Amazon ecosystem. Um, Whiskers Laces came in, you know, and that's not to say we don't have a perspective on where the market is and, and what's going on, but that's not our core business. We're not going to come in and tell someone, hey, you should launch these five products. Um, you know, there's a nice gap in the market here. Other service providers or other people can do that or do that, but we're not in that business. We, we, we really help when someone has a product and they believe in it and they really want to go heavy. We're the, we're the team to pick it up and run and, uh, and and really support it there. So someone like a Whiskers Laces, they were they had done well off of Amazon uh, first, had done pretty well and, and started picking up steam and speed. And uh, there was obviously a gap inside of Amazon from what they had seen. And they came to us and it, and it looked – and, you know, our initial um, – view on it was that you know there was a gap and uh and they decided to go in and go in hard with amazon and we gave some expectations and then we beat the expectations um and uh we've you know we supported them and done quite well with with their business but it's a similar business model right i mean shoelaces are everywhere socks were everywhere but then all of a sudden stance socks came out and they made the best socks in the world Whiskers laces uh, make some of the very best laces I've ever seen in the world. I love their product. Um, and if you want something to look a little bit different than just the traditional, you know, brown laces that you get with things or white laces that you get with your sneakers, then, uh, you know, they're perfect. It's a it's a fantastic product and fantastic business. So I love what they were doing. They were, they were, a, they were an ideal scenario set up to really, do really well on Amazon before we came in. And do you think part of that equation is the branding part also? So, you know, if a business that is coming uh, to Amazon and you have a lot of different competitors, you know, 
who are selling maybe you know on a very um, cheaper price and you're trying to compete with them the way to differentiate is it always good to have like a brand that that you're trying to differentiate your product even though it's a commodity product you're, you you find some angle of differentiating it and, and just by your branding uh, there's a better chance of doing that so I would say your question runs to a very deeper question of what is branding and what is the value of a brand um, and just kind of on the surface uh, as a response branding is you know, there's, there's a component of self-identity between people and their relationship with products and things they use every day. And branding is is uh, finding your position in a certain group and demographic of where you belong, right, in their life. And that their personal identity is tied to either your brand or your brand is fits well with them and their lifestyle. Um, and so there's always a, a stronger emotional connection with purchasing aside from just numerical purchasing of, oh, this is cheaper. I'm going to buy it cheaper, um, particularly in America and in Europe, uh, actually everywhere. Um, the branding has that emotional can have that emotional connection where I can buy Apple. Right. It really all Apple is are overpriced technology products. Right. That's all it is. But from a very you know, analytical perspective. They're just overpriced technology products that work really well. Um, from a branding perspective, it's it's like a self-image thing. Um, for me as myself and amongst my friends, you know, amongst my work colleagues, do I have an iPhone, do I not? Um, and, uh, and so there's like a big emotional tie-in. So people are willing to spend a lot more on that uh, brand, Apple brand. And that happens across all of branding. Right. And so when you're building your product in your niche, you know, it depends what you're doing. If you're building, you know, uh, another spatula, well, why? Would, what's the emotional connection with your spatula versus all the other thousands of spatulas that have been for sale for 100 for 100 plus years? Right. Um, and what is the difference? And that's on the that's on the owner. And yes, there's huge value there, because um, if you can build strong brand and a strong brand presence and uh, connection with the people, that uh, that's going to do really well in terms of lifetime value of your customers. They're going to keep coming back. They're going to spread the word. Uh, you'll be able to sell your company um, for much more when you get to that point. Or if you never do, then you have you know good customers for life as long as you keep that up. So branding is important, even though most people don't take it that seriously on Amazon. Most of Amazon products uh, that are at the top of their cate category are just product listings um, with good reviews. Right. That's that's most of what they are, and they, they don't have a strong brand. But uh, there is a huge side of that brand piece uh, if you really dive into it. So basically what you're saying, brand is good, but on Amazon, you don't necessarily need to have the brand. If you know the Amazon algorithm and, and are able to work with the different levers, you can still be the best seller there. Uh, yes, short term. That's where okay. the Amazon ecosystem is now. Yep, I don't think okay. that's going to be there long term. Okay. Uh, five years from now, it'll, it will not be there like the way it is now. Okay. Now, when you work with your clients, um, I read that you know you work with two main levers. One is the revenue part. One is the cost part. So reducing the cost, increasing the revenue. On the revenue side, I think you know there's uh, three big metrics. You, you have the page view, conversion, and the average price. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about these different levers and how you know how Amazon works and how you help. Uh, your your clients with these so on the revenue side uh, the page view so you know let's say that uh, this uh, company whiskers lace when when they came to you um, laces you know it's such a I'm sure there were a lot of different competitors how do you say okay uh, how do I get a, a percentage of the page you know people who are searching for this laces shoelaces on Amazon how do I get, uh, you know, some of that traffic to Whiskers Laces? So in terms of Amazon SEO, like what are some of the things that you did with Whiskers Laces that helped them to to get the page views to, to get that, uh, or the right page views to get that revenue uh, equation up? Yeah, so there's a um, very insightful question, and thank you for uh, understanding the framework <laughs> that we have to, to even ask that question. So. Yes, it's very simple math. Conversion rate times traffic equals unit sales, right? Unit yeah. sales times your average price point is your revenue. That's all that it comes down to. Um, and by the way, 
you know, we've explained this a little bit. We're in the business of building businesses inside of Amazon, and this is how we would analyze with with totally different frameworks, but um, uh, or different results in what the framework would be. But we would analyze a business and analyze how it functioned and what are the key drivers and mechanisms and levers that we needed to pull inside of Amazon, uh, and we would report on those. So we've done the same thing when we left Amazon. We did the same thing for the seller business. What are the key drivers and mechanisms that we have control over that we can drive and move things up and down. Um, the uh, the very first thing we'd actually look at is your conversion rate. Um, and your conversion rate basically is, you know, how many people are coming in your page and clicking converting the purchase. And your conversion rate's made up of your images, the text, your price, and your reviews. Now, by the, seen, by, the, by the way, on the back end of Amazon, you you get this metric, how many people are actually coming to your page. They, they so provide the, you that metric. Yeah, well, in the business, uh, only on the seller central side, right? So not on the vendor. And you get the analytics on, um, you get some data on the page views and then how many people have purchased. Okay. And so if you have page views and people purchased, you can come up with your conversion rate metric. Okay. Um, there's another metric in there that's uh, session based and not page view based, which is really similar. They're off by a little bit. But um, regardless, yes, you can get that data inside business reports uh, inside of Amazon. Okay. So. And Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. You, uh, okay. you know, you were, yeah. so, so then what we did, uh, so what we look at is, hey, how are these images being presented in Amazon? We have our own standard of how we want to make it best. Um, images and text and the price point is something very interesting. We've sometimes changed price up and conversion rate goes up. Sometimes we change it down and conversion rate goes up. So that's some of the price testing that we do when, when we bring stuff in inside of Amazon. Uh, for our clients. We try and test that for them. Um, on the traffic side, there are two types of traffic, and that's what your question is about. Um, there's both organic traffic, and then there's uh, what we call influence traffic, which is basically the, like paid, stuff that you go out and you try and find and or you pay for. So all the Amazon PPC, the sponsored ads, are all paid traffic. Um, and you, with, with just some money, you can get some paid traffic going on your listing. Um, you have to do some research and find what are the keywords that people would be looking for to find your product and uh, and then start spending some money on some ads. And as you do that, you will start showing up and you'll get some traffic on your listing. Um, there's Now there, that's influence traffic. Then there's the, uh, the organic traffic or essentially Amazon SEO. So um, if I can interrupt you just for a second. So you said, you know, people can find out the, the keywords. So these keywords would be different. These these keywords would be specific for Amazon, like the Amazon search, right? That's right. And and is that da is that data um, available on Amazon in the back end also, or or this is like a, there's a different way of finding this? No, you have to look for it. You have to look for it and analyze it um, on your on your own uh, to find what that data is. And we've done a lot of stuff with Google, right? Like you can take Google data and. Um, and find and use similar data inside of Google uh, and use it inside of Amazon to make it work. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so, so you were saying that you know, um, uh, yeah, pr promotions and uh, organic traffic. Um, you were saying that. Uh, yeah, getting up, getting some promotions, getting some advertising going, and setting up your back end keywords and taking your keywords, putting them in the back end of your listings, will essentially start the traffic running. Uh, to your to your product, and you'll start getting a ranking um, inside of Amazon, and then you got to spend time trying to improve what that ranking is, or improve the traffic in, in other with other measures, other means. So you recommend that you know if someone is just launching a product uh, without any reviews, it's like a pure, uh, completely new listing. Um, the best way to go about bringing traffic is to uh, turn on the Amazon uh, paid traffic, because uh, uh, yeah, that's one of the ways. Yep. Paid traffic, uh, doing promotions. You can do off Amazon promotions, getting traffic, dumping it into Amazon. There's a lots of different strategies and methodologies, um, and uh, there's various different reasons to do any one of those. Um, but yeah, that I mean, it is it's a traffic game, and you got to get conversion rates, and you got to get traffic to to make it all work. So now the organic traffic on Amazon, I think there's four factors that I. Um, uh, uh, that, that I read. There's the title. There's the the content keywords. There's the listing back end, and there's the categorization. Are uh -huh. they like in terms of weighting of which factor is important in terms of you know when people search for things uh, on the Amazon search? Um, 
in your in your opinion, like what are some of the important things that people should look out or, or um, optimize to 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 have the best success? Yeah, I would say the keywords are probably the the, the biggest piece. Um, particularly the title, what you have in your content, um, the keywords that are in your title and in the body of the email or of the of the uh, cert, uh, of your page, your detail page. Those keywords are, are some of the most important um, of all of them in terms of stack ranking things. Um, categorization can matter. Um, uh, it can matter quite a bit, but most of the time people get it right, unless Amazon moves you, which drives everyone crazy when they're moving you around categories. Um, so yeah, I would say uh, kind of the, the, the keywords, getting those right and getting it in the right content is the most important. So. Uh Categorization for us, for example, this lace company that is selling like selling like premium laces. Um, instead of putting them in like a regular shoe category, would you much rather because it's premium laces? Let's let's say for golf shoes or you know some other kind of uh, shoes. Uh, would you much rather categorize them in, under like golf sport, and that would give them better chances of driving the right kind of traffic? Because even if someone yeah searches for lace and, and they find their business and they find that their, their prices are too high, they will probably not end up buying it. So is that part of the uh, idea? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right on. Um, you're right on. So that may not be in that specific example, but yes, that, that's a, that's generally um, what you want to look at is, hey, is laces too broad? Are generally shoelaces too broad when these are mainly for dress shoes? So do we jump into dress shoes and we do dress shoelaces? Um, or men's dress shoe laces versus just general laces or sneaker laces, things like that. Um, and putting it in the different categories can can impact um, your your visibility and where you get inside of Amazon. And the the SEO optimization that you do on Amazon does that also work for Google? So when you know a lot of times people instead of going directly on Amazon, they would go on Google and they would say, "Hey, I'm looking for you know men's red shoes or whatever." Uh, and a lot of times, so, you know, you get the Amazon listing coming up on Google. How does that work? Yeah, so that does not work the same. I mean, the SEO are different. Amazon SEO is different than Google SEO. Okay. That said, if there are keyword triggers inside of Amazon that are that are that are being scraped by Google and used by Google for you to come up, that is going to be effective. So. The actual keywords that you're using inside of Amazon, your Amazon listing do affect what your Google SEO is going to be. Um, in terms of like how things rank, Amazon's totally different than Google. Um, and so you actually have to work on stuff inside of Amazon to come up. On the Google side, uh, it's you gotta do other things to, to try and be relevant uh, for the Google searches, but it's mainly getting the right keywords in place um, on that side. Okay. Uh, now you talked a little bit about the price optimization, and I know uh, one of the other companies that you worked with, Willow and Everett, uh, you helped them with their price optimization. And one of the things that I read is that you implemented a dynamic price strategy where the prices, you know, lowered or increased dynamically. Is that something that you did like on their personal site, or is that is this a capability that can be done on Amazon also? This was uh, on Amazon. We went through. Um, and adjusted. Now you don't want to, you don't want to change the pricing too often. Amazon can flag you, but there's a certain time time span where we adjusted some of their pricing um, up and down based on where the competitors were on their products, based on where they were. That that uh, drove for a higher revenue and higher profit margin there. Okay. Uh, and 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 this is something that you can like in terms of dynamic. Um, what I'm understanding that this is like an automatic change. Is that does Amazon have that capability? No, no, they don't. They don't. Okay. So how did you uh, do that? So you there are systems that you can pipe into Amazon to make dynamic changes if you need okay. to. Okay. And that is through APIs and stuff. Uh huh. That's through APIs. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um. One of the other case studies that I found on your website was of this business called Flotation IQ. And uh -huh. I think one of the things that you helped them was uh, with their product redesign and uh, I guess uh, changing the size of their product. And this is uh -huh. very interesting to me uh, for um, for products that are larger size, so large volume, maybe, maybe uh, you know, large weight. 
how how does is it is it really just that you decrease the total volume of the product and that helps or or does it matter like how if if the length is uh, l- larger that's okay and but the width is not um, so there's two yeah in terms of shipping there's two pieces there's uh dimensional weight and then there's actual weight uh when they calculate shipping prices and dimensional weight is based on it has nothing to do with weight it's just what are the dimensions of this product and they have a scoring in a scoring table when you're fulfilling and when you're sending in product to ship through shipping, you have this 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 table and its dimensional weight is whatever you know it might be I don't know 300 inches um, versus the actual weight may only be like 10 pounds or 20 pounds, um, and it's looking at whatever one's greater. And so if your weight is below a certain threshold, and there's always thresholds like hey at this threshold you're charged. X dollars at this threshold, you charge X Y dollars, and so on. And we do an analysis. We look at okay, where are these products, and where are they being, um, and is there room for improvement in a, either a dimensional capacity or a weight capacity to go down a step, right, and save money on shipping. And uh, in many scenarios, like there's one scenario we saved uh, seventy dollars per unit. Uh, just by adjusting about two inches off of a product, right? And that's and that goes directly to your bottom line, right? That's seventy dollars you would have spent on shipping that you don't no longer spend anymore on shipping just by changing your, your dimensional size uh, to be able to be optimized for um, the mail and, and sending it through uh, FedEx, U, UPS, USPS, or however it might be. What are your thoughts on Amazon FBA? And do you think uh, for businesses to uh, choose like FBA versus like a third party e-commerce fulfillment. Uh, do you think in terms of like uh, just the pricing costing uh, is FBA more efficient in your experience than like just a third party uh, logistic yeah. service? So I've never found anyone to beat Amazon uh, for two day shipping. Um, I've never found prices that beat Amazon's prices for two day shipping. That said, sometimes you want to change your product to like a three or four or five day shipping, and then you can beat an FBA price through a 3PL. Um, I've had you know lots of clients come in and be like, hey, we got this great agreement with UPS, and we've had it for 10, 20 years. They still don't beat Amazon in terms of their pricing. Um, I'm a huge fan of, of FBA and what it does. Now, there are scenarios where it does not make sense for a business, um, and, uh, and those are you know typically you got customized stuff, you got hazmat stuff, you have oversized goods. Some of those scenarios that are really hard for FBA to solve for uh, make a lot more sense on a 3PL. Um, and then sometimes there can be inventory staging uh, scenarios where it makes more sense for you to be a 3PL in terms of costs, uh, the, all the costs that, that come in. Uh, but in general, FBA is, is the best way uh, by far. And you get the prime badge. Um, when you're FBA, and if you have that Prime badge, you generally see sales lift around 40%. That was the number internally that uh, we would um, uh, advocate inside of Amazon to to sellers. Is uh, that generally there's a 40% lift when you're FBA or when you're Prime versus when you're not Prime. That's that's a pretty large uh, difference. Um, yep. What does uh, what does your team look like right now? Like your own business? Do you uh, in terms of people who help uh, your clients, um, can you share a little bit? You know what your team looks like. Are they all remote? Uh, everything. Uh, so we have around forty-five people who work for us, um, and we set us our we set our system up so we have business managers, and these are kind of like mini CEOs of 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 the business, the ones that work directly with the clients. Um, and they're the ones who know the business the best. They develop the strategy, and they're the ones who are essentially running and operating everything. Then we have support teams around them that help and run and optimize uh, all the listings and everything that they need done. Um, and then they help and they report into the the business managers. And their business managers um, basically they they're responsible for everything, so they got to make sure everything's done and um, and accomplished. But uh, they're the ones sending out the tasks to the to the internal specialist teams. And that's, uh, yeah, that's generally how we work. Now, previously you had mentioned a little bit about your own technology platform. And I want to, uh, I'm interested in learning um, a little bit about 
uh, what are some of the other tools available in the market versus, you know, the tools that you're developing yourself? And, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, getting access through the APIs. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendation of some of these tools that can help you in terms of getting more data so, about your business and also competitive intelligence, things like this? Yeah, so there's some tools that just don't solve. Uh, so what we found is our use case is different. Most tools are built for various different vertical slices of what needs to happen in running and operating an Amazon business, little ta uh, tactics, right? Which are all very, which you need to do. Um, and there's a lot of tools that solve these various different things. So one of the best that we that we really like is managed by stats. That's a that's a huge one that, that we really like and how they report out and how they operate. Um, then there's tools like Jungle Scout if you're looking for you know market competitive research. They've been the first in the industry to to uh, even try and estimate what sales are. Um, then there's several other tools like a uh, Helium Ten. I know is, is a pretty popular one. Um, every once in a while we you know we they have they have a cool something that we might use. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I guess there's three there's three various tools to d definitely take a look at. Okay. Now we're going to move on to our rapid fire round where I'm going to ask you a few questions and you have to answer them in uh, one or two words or one or two sentences. Oh, so, no. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one is, uh, do you have any book recommendations for entrepreneurs or business executives in 2020 and why? In this space, I actually just recently reread uh, Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, found it very insightful in this new Am uh, Amazon e-commerce space and racing to to be one of the you know the next big product inside of Amazon. Uh, an innovative product or idea in the current e-commerce retail or tech landscape that you're excited about? Ooh, I personally this is weird. Personally, I love LED lights and the technology around LED lighting. Um, in uh, both applications and offices and homes. And uh, there's some cool technology about connecting those to the web and doing just some innovative stuff there. That's not big, it's not gonna be huge, but it's kind of like a little hobby thing that's pretty fascinating to me. But isn't, isn't that uh, related to the Internet of Things? Like, uh, uh, is that, is it, was that you were referring to or? Just the just LED lighting, and it, it, it's it, like I love how energy efficient it is, and that you can do so much with it uh, in okay. various different ways. So you can hook it up to online APIs in the cloud service, and and kind of fun stuff. That that's kind of a weak one. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's just more of a hobby one. Some of the cooler stuff. I love what Tesla's doing, um, and I never cease to be amazed by the stuff that uh, Musk is Elon Musk is doing. I love him as a leader. <laughs> Um, a productivity tool or software that you either use or recommend? Uh, we become huge fans of Google Suite um, because of the interconnectivity between all the products and then the shareability, that everything can be shared. Um, and there's a lot of collaboration. We all jump into a spreadsheet, we all collaborate on it. Um, I really like Google Suite lately. Actually, them and Zoho. I really like Zoho if you've never used it before. It's a, I looked a lot for um, kind of a platform that's scalable and expandable and cost effective. And Zoho, actually been really impressed by them lately also. Okay. Um, a peer entrepreneur or business person who inspires you? Ooh. Um, oh, so this feels a little weird. I got a buddy, his name's uh, Mike McAnelli, and he's running a, a, a dentistry um, uh, startup firm, and he inspires me. He's a he's a good he's a good man. Okay, um, he's not very so people probably wouldn't even know. Okay, uh, and finally, best business advice that you have ever received or you would give to to new entrepreneurs. Um, here's two things. Uh, one is life advice. I'll say, uh, I read this quote. By Huxley, I think it's Thomas Huxley. Uh, Learn something about everything and everything about something. Hmm. I love that quote. Um, in terms of always be broad-minded, but become an expert at one thing. So and you were saying one for life, life advice, and was there a different one also? That's a life one. Uh, being an entrepreneur, one thing I learned. This is this will take longer. This isn't two sentences. 
but uh, <clears throat> I learned about strategy from teaching chess uh, when I was in, in college. Uh, I taught chess to kids, and I used to think, a long time ago, I used to think chess was all about understanding five moves ahead, ten moves ahead, whatever. Chess isn't necessarily that, at least my understanding of it isn't that. Chess is about understanding positioning your pieces and providing the most options. You don't know what the future is going to be, but you can position your your pieces to provide you the most defensibility or attacking positions um, regardless of what the competitors do. And so in business, you don't know what the future is going to be, but position yourself to give yourself the most options um, or the best options uh, when they come about because you don't know what they're going to be. Perfect. Thank you so much uh, for all the uh, for sharing your story, for all the business insights. Um, uh, those were all the questions that I had. Um, now is your opportunity if you want to share, you know, how people can get in touch with you or, you know, get in touch for your products or services. Please yeah. uh, share. Yeah, uh, definitely jump on to our website, productlabs.ai, um, and uh, or reach out to us services at productlabs.ai um, and reach out and love to connect and, and help out. We've helped, uh, you know, again, big, big companies. Uh, we've helped a lot of private equity firms understand what they're doing. We've helped um, investment groups. We've helped enterprise companies, people inside enterprise companies trying to push Amazon when the top leadership doesn't necessarily want to yet. Uh, we've helped startups and we've helped SMBs really scale what they're doing. So we'd love to just to talk or, um, yeah, help you out in any way that if you want to understand Amazon, hopefully uh, we can help you out. Perfect. Thank you, Brad, so much for your time, uh, for uh, sharing your story, for sharing all the insights. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and I wish you all the best uh, in your business. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.